basics of attribute sampling. This is the first set of PowerPoints you should review on this topic. Why do we do attribute sampling? The basic answer is so that we can count on an internal control in an audit. If we do not have the ability to rely on controls, it's very, very difficult and very expensive to conduct an audit. We want to look at only a few transactions that, that are included in the financial statements, relatively few, and be able to draw the conclusion that the ones we see are like all the ones we don't see. The only way we know that happens is through internal control. Therefore, we do attribute sampling to see if we can reasonably rely on controls. We only test controls that are designed correctly and we think operate well. And we try not to waste our time testing controls that do not operate as designed. What kinds of questions can we answer using attribute sampling? Well, there are always yes or no questions. Are credit sales made to customers with approved credit? Does shipment of goods always come before billing? Are all checks signed by an authorized person? Are goods purchased only from an approved vendor? But I don't want you to think that attribute sampling is just an eclectic set of questions. When you review the setting up of attribute sampling and attribute sampling examples videos, you'll see that we test a big set of attributes in it when we get any one document. What kinds of questions can't we answer using attribute sampling? Well, the biggest one is whether the account balances related to a control are misstated. We can find that a big set of internal controls works perfectly and the client is doing the accounting wrong, so as they process every transaction similarly, they're all being processed wrong. On the other hand, the client might not have any good internal controls in an area, such as payroll, but the payroll person does their job perfectly and payroll could still be correctly recorded. So we have to do both tests of balances and attribute sampling. This sl slide shows the information you need to set up attribute sampling if you're doing statistical sampling. The basic question you always need to answer first is what's the population we're testing? What are all the instances of the control? The best way for you to see how easily you can go astray is to think about checks. If we ask the client for the number of checks they issue in a year, they might say 5,000. But that's not the kind of information that tells you what the population is. That tells you how big it is. But what we really need to know is from what check number to what check number? Is it from check number 1,000 to check number 6,000 that they issued? No, maybe they've been in business for an awfully long time. Maybe it's for check number 45,000 to check 50,000 that was issued this year. Then we need to identify the attribute you will test. So for example, if we're going to look for an authorized signature, maybe what we want to test is an electronic signature, maybe it's a handwritten signature. Is it in a certain color of ink? Is it script? Is it a certain typeface? We need to know what the correct attribute, what the signature looks like. The next three slides talk about factors we need to determine the sample size if we're going to do statistical sampling. The biggest question is how sure do we want to be that our test is right? That's what this topic is. The risk of assessing control risk is too low. I say a control is good, it means control risk is low. If I'm right about that, if we have great controls, we'll do relatively lo less testing on the rest of the audit. So how sure do I want to be that I get the right answer on a control? I'd have to test every item in the population to be 100% sure. Can't do that. If I don't test any, I'm 0% sure can't do that. So we have to decide somewhere between 0 and 100. Usually we pick a low number, a low chance of getting the answer wrong. But in some audits you'll see that we might go up to 20% because it's a control we don't care about that much. So 
that's one of the items you'll see that you need when you go on to do the attribute sampling problems. The next item you need to set is the tolerable misstatement rate. This is the percent of time we decide the control can fail and we're still going to say everything's fine. Sometimes we can tolerate zero failures. It's a very important control. Sometimes we can tolerate more. Most of the time we don't tolerate a very high failure rate. Maybe 10% would be a really high failure rate to us. The higher we set the tolerable error rate, the easier, the easier it's going to be to declare the control working fine. So that's kind of a competing interest for auditors. Auditors understand that setting a very low tolerable misstatement rate means we need a bigger sample. It's a more expensive thing to test a bigger sample. So if I want all my sample sizes to be pretty small, I'll set a high tolerable misstatement rate. The tolerable misstatement rate is supposed to be affected by whether the control is automated or not, automated controls fail less than manual controls, uh, how complicated or hard it is to do the control correctly. So for example, it's hard to get a bank reconciliation to work out at a company compared to it's not so hard to lock the register when you're done using it. So different controls have different tolerable misstatement rates. The next element we need is the expected misstatement rate. This is the rate that we believe the control will fail. This rate has to be lower than the tolerable misstatement rate or we won't test the control. If I say I can tolerate only 4% mistakes, but I expect 10% mistakes, then the control does not help me. I'm going to find, I think I'm going to find that the control does not operate as designed. So I need the expected misstatement rate to be lower than the tolerable misstatement rate in order to test a control. The expected misstatement rate is based on last year's testing, changes the client might have made to improve the controls, or changes the client might have made that would make the control work less well, and the nature of the control. Once I have the sample size, I collect the sample. A computer can do this for us by con collecting random items from across the population. Or we can tell the computer, pick every 1,000th check. That's a systematic collection that you'll read about. Or we can choose a sample as a block. The entire sample is a set of consecutive items if it's block sampling. We use block sampling for example, in cutoff testing at year end. I'll take the last 10 shipments of one period and the first 10 of the next. That gives me a sample size of 20. And each transaction I'll look to see if it's booked in the right period, yes or no. And I'll be able to tell if the client stopped recording transactions for the year of the audit on the right transa transaction. So I collect the sample and I test the sample. Each item in the sample is answered either by yes it operates as designed or no it doesn't. And I produce from that a, sing a sample failure rate, which is simply the number of failures divided by the sample size. The sample failure rate is not terribly important to auditors, but it's usually fairly important to the client. Because based on the sample failure rate, we might ask the client to make some changes in their controls. And then finally, to draw a, a conclusion in attribute sampling, what we need to do is project from the sample to the population. So in the PowerPoint slides and in the book where we talk about how to do attribute sampling, you're going to see something called the achieved upper error limit. This is, I think the control may fail as much as X percent of the time. The sample error rate and the population error rate are not the same unless you can guarantee that you didn't do anything wrong. And auditors never can make such a guarantee. So we know there's always sampling risk, which you'll see about in a separate set of PowerPoints. We always worry that we have sampling non and non-sampling risk present. And therefore, we always have to use statistical samples to project from 
the sample to the population. Once we've done that, if the tolerable misstatement limit, the rate we said we could accept, is greater than the achieved upper error limit, the highest we think the population failure rate is, we'll accept the control.